So the topic is blood glucose control and exercise. Um, the way I understand the topic and what needs to go in there, it's very helpful to understand a little bit about blood sugar levels and how they are regulated to then understand what ex exercise does for uh, blood sugar control. I'll then go into the impact of food choices on blood sugar and review the impact of exercise on blood sugar, how much, um, well, how much carbohydrates really is the question, is too much, how much should you get? And finally, I have a few resources for smart food choice ideas uh, to get a little further. Any questions? to start with. Okay, then we'll plow right ahead. So blood sugar is something that obviously our body needs, otherwise we wouldn't have it. So where blood uh, glucose is needed and used is depicted here. So the sugar in the blood is called glucose. Any other sugar that we eat um, either does not impact the blood sugar levels or is transformed into the specific sugar glucose. So glucose is used in uh, by the liver. It can be transformed into fat. And when it's transformed into fat, it goes into adipose tissue as fat. Glucose is also used by the kidneys. The kidneys rely on glucose. They can make their own though, but if they can get it from the blood, they will. Glucose is also needed by red blood cells. They cannot use anything other than glucose. Most other tissues in our body can use, for example, ketone bodies. Red blood cells cannot do that. The brain is glucose dependent. It takes a couple of days to switch it to ketone bodies if you go on a keto diet, but generally the brain uses glucose. And finally, muscles use glucose. Muscles can also use fat, but they do use glucose as well. And we'll get a little more into that. So all of these uh, organs, need glucose. Accordingly, glucose needs to be in the blood and we refer to it either as blood glucose or as blood sugar. Question then is how much? There is a normal level depicted here in the middle. The white dots are supposed to reflect the, um, the blood glucose. In hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, there is not enough sugar for our organs to function normally. And then there is the other side that is much more frequent, which is too much sugar called hyperglycemia, too much sugar in the blood. There are a few measures of blood sugar. The long-term measure that is really very, very useful for persons um, whose blood sugar is regulated properly is the so-called hemoglobin A1C, sometimes called HbA1C or just A1C. This A1C really is a common term used. It measures blood sugar levels over the last three months. How does this work? Your red blood cells carry hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is responsible for carrying oxygen to the tissues. Okay. Hemoglobin is a protein. Glucose has the property of sticking to proteins. Hemoglobin is very convenient as a measure because you can just quickly take a uh, blood sample that is relatively easily accessible isolate the hemoglobin and measure how much of it carries this glucose on it. There is a certain level that is normal, four to 5.6% of this hemoglobin in normal people 
carry a glucose molecule on them. If the level is higher, that means that there is on average too much sugar in the blood. Okay, so that's an indicator then for dysregulation of blood sugar. Okay. The calculation is glyc uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, so that hemoglobin with the glucose overall, and that's expressed as percent. So when your doctor tells you your A1C is high, this is what they refer to. It is above 5.6% of the hemoglobin that glucose got stuck to. So your average blood glucose level is too high. All right, so far so good. So when that happens, you are diagnosed with either pre-diabetes, diabetes, where's your A1C here? So if it's uh, 5.7, but below 6.5, then it's pre-diabetes. If it's above 6.5, then it's indicative of diabetes. And that always goes together with a second measure that also indicates to, that the blood sugar levels are too high to get to a diagnosis. So either the actual blood sugar is too high or you do a um, test of your body where you, uh, where you drink a glucose drink and the blood sugar is measured in intervals after you drink that, uh, that beverage and it should come down within two hours to a normal level. And if it doesn't, if it is too high, then again, it's pre-diabetes or diabetes. So the A1C is used uh, to diagnose if you have on average two high blood glucose levels. The fasting glucose shows you if you have your glucose levels are too high in the morning, there can be several reasons for that. And this uh, test with a glucose beverage tells you if your body is able to bring the, the blood glucose levels down after you have consumed uh, sugar as it normally would. Okay, so what happens normally when you take in glucose? Your normal blood glucose levels are shown up here in the green line. Okay, so this is the the hours of the day. Here you have breakfast, your blood sugar levels go up because you typically eat something that has at least some sugar in it. And this would be lunch and this would be dinner. So this is relatively simplified. There are no snacks in here just for the principle of how it works. When you eat anything containing glucose and your blood sugar levels rise because you're absorbing the sugar from, um, from the intestines, your body responds with insulin. Insulin is what your body uses to bring the blood sugar levels down so that um, it is at the desirable level where the proteins don't get dysfunctional by glucose sticking to them. Uh, but your body organs can function normally, your brain, your kidneys, your red blood cells all have the sugar they need to function. Okay, so insulin is used by the body to normalize blood sugar. And you can see here the spikes of insulin in the purple uh, after breakfast. And you can see that it takes a little moment until the sugar appears in the blood because it has to digest first and uh, absorb. And then the body reacts with insulin within 15 minutes. After lunch, the same thing. And after dinner, you have another insulin spike. So this is what happens in normal people. And then you see in the green curve that with the help of insulin, uh, the blood sugar normalizes relatively quickly and stays within these normal ranges where everything functions perfectly. Right. When everything doesn't really function normally, you have the case of drawn here in purple, a person with diabetes, where after consumption of blood sugar, the blood sugar does not go down like in a normal person, but it stays high. That means that 
there is too much sugar in the blood, that sugar will stick to proteins. They are the workhorses in, in your body. If sugar sticks to them, they become dysfunctional. So this is not a good situation and the body will be somewhat dysfunctional. You don't really feel it when you have too high blood sugar, but your body carries the, the consequences of that high sugar. Okay. So let's take a look at what exercise then does for insulin, uh, for the effect of insulin for the glucose levels in the body. So I said insulin is used by the body to get the blood sugar levels down. What it does is depicted here, this little orange dot is insulin. It binds to something on your body cells, the insulin receptor, and then via a couple of detours, makes sure that the cells take up sugar out of the blood into the cells. So they remove the sugar from the blood. That means that the sugar in the blood normalizes. Your cells in turn get the sugar and they can either store it or use it for energy. Okay, so many of your cells, particularly muscle cells, have high storage for glucose and it depends on how well you train your muscles, how much glucose is actually stored in the muscle cells. Another storage system for glucose is the liver. The liver also has high storage for glucose in the storage form of glycogen. Now, so far so good. So insulin removes the sugar from the blood and gets it into the cells. When the cells have enough glucose in them, they do not want to take up more. How do the cells know if they have enough sugar in them? The key term that will be tonight's favorite term, and you can impress everybody around you in it afterwards, because I will be using that from here on out a lot. Uh, the key term is AMPK. AMPK is a sensor. It senses when the cell has low energy levels. When the cell does have low energy levels, AMPK tells this glucose transporter, if there is any insulin around, please pick up some glucose. So if there is any insulin around, with the help of this sensor that the cell has low energy, there will be more glucose removed from the blood and the blood sugar levels will normalize. Okay, cell gets the energy um, and everybody is hopefully happy. So these low energy levels in the cell can be triggered by muscle contraction. When you use a muscle, you use energy and at least some of the energy, no matter how hard or not hard you work, at least some of the energy is provided by glucose. So when you use a muscle, the cell goes into low energy state. AMPK, our sensor is activated and if there's any insulin around, glucose is allowed to get into the cell, lowering the blood sugar levels. If the blood sugar levels are low, the liver will replenish as best it can. If you're digesting something at the same time, because you have eaten a little while ago, that will also replenish the glucose in the blood. Um, Either way, the glucose levels in the blood will be lower than without the muscle contraction. Okay, so muscle contraction can help normalize the blood sugar levels. There are some other factors that can do that that I don't really want to go too deep into. Okay. So low energy levels trigger the activation of this sensor AMPK that leads to glucose moving into the cell. Okay. Um, the bigger the exercise muscle or the bigger the sum of the muscles that you're using, so whole body exercise, the more energy is used. 
So the more glucose is needed to replenish and the more glucose you can move into cells and out of the bloodstream. Okay. When you exercise and train, um, the fuel that your muscle uses changes. So once the glucose that your muscle has used is replenished, the muscle will stop taking up more blood sugar until you exercise again. So exercise really only works in the minute. As soon as glycogen is rest uh, restored, you have enough glucose in the cell. This sensor says, I have enough energy, stop importing glucose. Okay. When you use an, um, an exercise app of any kind, they typically tell you something about recovery time. That, is, uh, that includes the time that your muscles need to actually rebuild their energy storage. And that is the time that this glucose transport into the cell is still active okay? until um, the cell really has enough glucose built up again. Okay. Training of um, your muscles um, leads to a few changes over time. So one, you build up more muscle. Many people actually do training for that purpose. That means you have now more cells that, that can use glucose. Okay? At the same time with training, the muscles become better at using fat. That re does reduce their need for glucose. So they are taking up le less glucose from the bloodstream but it does increase the use of lipids. So that leads to a better lipid profile. So higher good cholesterol, the HDL, lower triglycerides and lower bad cholesterol or LDL. So if you have high cholesterol and you start exercising, your muscles use increasingly lipids, the better they are trained um, and that in, improves your um, your cholesterol levels at the same time. Okay. They still do use glucose and it depends on how intensely you exercise, what exactly it is they're using. It's always both, but the ratio uh, varies. So to sum this up, when you exercise, you use glucose, your sensor says low energy, please get me some glucose out of the blood. The glucose transporter, um, is put to the cell membrane and you're absorbing the glucose from the bloodstream into the cell. And that does lower blood glucose levels. For persons who um, usually have higher blood glucose levels, the response to insulin is reduced. What happens in these people is that the sensor generally says we have enough energy in the cell. So you actually have to start exercising to reach a low energy level and get these muscles to say, we need a bit of glucose. I will take that from the bloodstream. If I have any insulin, I will pick up uh, glucose from the blood. Okay. So for the uh, high blood glucose levels, exercise is very helpful to get the blood sugar levels down. Now I'm keeping it relatively simple in the liver place, its own separate role, but that is um, a bit separate and very specific to diabetes. Now, um, before I move on to the next point, is this uptake of glucose from the bloodstream clear? If not, please put something in the chat. Okay. All right. So the next question then is, I've already explained 
how the blood sugar levels are regulated and the role of our favorite new sensor AMPK. So the next thing that uh, affects blood glucose levels is food choices and they interplay with this sensor. So let's take a look at that. Depending on what food choices you make, your blood sugar can rise very fast, like here, or much slower. If your blood sugar rises very fast, your body puts out a lot of insulin, more than it needs to get all that sugar into the cells. Okay, because that it happens so fast, the rise is very steep. That gives a, a very strong trigger to the um, to the pancreas to put out more insulin to take care of that blood sugar, and it puts out too much. So the result is that the blood sugar drops below the normal level. When the drop, blood sugar drops below the normal level the cells that need sugar, like your brain, your kidney, your red blood cells, scream for more sugar. They depend on this sugar to function. So the result is you feel hungry. Even though all your cells, your fat cells, your muscle cells have just soaked up a lot of sugar, the cells that depend on sugar, brain, kidneys, red blood cells, scream for more, you're hungry. That does not happen when the foods that you eat are digested more slowly so that the sugar levels rise more slowly. You have less um, demand for insulin because the rise is nice and slow. Um, the insulin that is secreted is not too much. It just so takes care of the sugar that you have eaten. If you eat it as sugar or as flour or as corn or sweet peas, doesn't matter. It takes care of just the sugar that you have consumed. Your blood sugar levels do not drop below normal and you feel full longer. So no cell needs to cry out for more sugar because the blood sugar levels never drop below normal. That type of choice then prevents you from being hungry, even though your cells technically are full of sugar and just those that really depend on the glucose feel the need for more. That level of how steep the blood sugar, uh, the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream is, has been called the glycemic index. The glycemic index is um, expressed as numbers. They ultimately reflect percent to a reference food. Low glycemic index is below 55. High glycemic index is above 70. Okay. There is sadly a problem with the glycemic index. Oops. Okay. You can take advantage of this knowledge to reset your eating habits and prevent overeating and at the same time normalize, keep the blood sugar levels in more normal um, ranges. So the cycle again is you're hungry, you're making thoughtless food choices that are high fat, high added sugar, highly processed as in, I am really hungry. I know my fridge is full of fresh vegetables, but I'm going to eat that candy bar anyway, because I need something right now. Okay, so thoughtless food choices. When you have that highly digestible um, sugar in there, you get the fast digesting glucose and insulin spike. Too much insulin, then the blood sugar drops and you feel hungry again, even though you have just eaten and you technically do have enough energy. Okay, so that circle can be broken by making smart food choices as in processed only as far as needed, no added sugars, little added fats, that leads to less insulin needed. 
So you flatten the curve of your blood sugar, flatten the curve of the insulin, and your blood sugars never drop below normal levels, and you don't get hungry before you actually do need food. Okay, so the glycemic index, there are some high glycemic uh, foods that are well known like uh, chips, biscuits, cakes, ice cream, etc. Potatoes count in them. Many processed foods have a high glycemic index. Um, watermelon and white bread, whereas the lower glycemic index foods are your whole grains, vegetables, legumes like lentils, uh, pasta is listed here. That can go both ways. Oats are listed here, and I'll tell you why it can go both ways. Okay, so you have a list of glycemic index um, values here that underline again that you have whole grains with a low glycemic index, whereas the refined grains, including here oatmeal, have a high glycemic index of over 70. So your bagels, your white bread, um, baked potatoes all have a high glycemic index. Vegetables generally a low glycemic index. They also contain very little glucose. Fruits are somewhere in the middle. They do have some sugar, but they have that sugar packaged in the tissue of the fruit, so it is not so easily accessible. Whereas your processed foods and your starchy vegetables, including potatoes, sweet potatoes, have that glucose a little easier accessible. Dairy, low glycemic index also contains limited sugar unless you pound it in there, adding chocolate powder. And your proteins generally are lower in glycemic index. You will see here that it's just legumes because your meats, poultry, fish don't have any sugar. Then, So their glycemic index is very low. They don't have anything to contribute there. The problem with the concept of glycemic index, even though it is very often used in... Um, not so great literature, so that's why I'm talking about it at all. This concept does not work. The glycemic index, even though it is very well researched, is only determined for single foods. As soon as you combine foods, all bets are off where the glycemic index is going to be. So you would technically have to test each and every meal combination uh, to figure out what the glycemic index is going to be. So you see here white bread, you don't see pizza anywhere here because pizza is a combined food. Okay, and then it seems to be not only that we can't predict the glycemic index in combinations, but that there are individual differences as to how well we digest foods. So glycemic index very often cited and used for some weird concept of diet, it does not work. What does definitely work is to go for the whole grains, fruits, vegetables, process only as much as needed. So yes, boil your potatoes and definitely cook all flours, including pasta, um, so that the starch is digestible. But don't over process, don't go for the, uh, for the processed foods that you, that you can buy. Okay, so when there is yogurt, go for the plain yogurt and add whatever you want to add yourself. If you want yogurt with fruit, add the fruit yourself so that you can control how much goes in there, etc. Okay, so checking glycemic index off the list of things to really worry about. Foods with starch, where do you find the foods that are high in glucose that will increase your sugar levels? Bread, cereals, pasta, rice, potatoes, beans, um, all variants of beans except for green beans, chestnuts, and I'm sure there are more um, like uh, Cassava, for example, that are not so common in the classic uh, Western diet, 
that are staple foods elsewhere that are also starchy foods. Okay, so I said whole grains as much as possible. And I'd like to show you why whole grains as much as possible on two occasions. One from a nutrition perspective. So from the blood glucose perspective, the glycemic index of whole grains is lower than that of refined grains. From a nutrition perspective, the bar on the right shows you the nutrient levels of all these nutrients on the left in whole grain. And you don't have to read all the names. It's all the micronutrients, vitamins, minerals um, that are in whole grain. The refined grain level is shown here as percentage. So in refined grain, you have much less of the nutrients your body needs to function compared to whole grain. That alone should push us to use whole grain whenever possible. Okay. Additionally, as I said, the whole grain has a lower glycemic index. The starch digests more slowly. You have less need for insulin, a smoother curve. You don't go into that low blood glucose level. You don't feel that slump after eating where you feel sluggish, tired, and essentially very soon hungry again. So that's uh, the whole grain part. So for rice, there is brown rice. Yes, it does take a lot longer to cook. You can cook it ahead of time and heat it up uh, when you need it, or you can cook it and freeze it in portion sizes to deal with that longer um, boiling time, just as one example. Whole grain bread, make sure it actually is whole grain not just 100% wheat or seven grain or so, it needs to actually say whole grain um, to have that quality. Okay. The second part, uh, why the glycemic index is so unreliable and what you need to keep in mind to control the blood sugar levels is portion size. So I just put that in here to not forget that portion size plays a role. Okay, um, the effect of um, what you eat on blood sugar depends on how much sugar is in what you eat. And that depends, of course, on how much you eat of it. So one serving or 15 grams of carbohydrate would be one slice of bread, one cup of cereal, half a cup of pasta, a third cup of cooked rice, and half a cup of beans. So if you think about a plate of pasta, do yourself a favor and measure out how much you put on a plate of pasta, how many servings of carbohydrates those, are, those actually are. So if you eat a ton of starch, you do get a pretty high spike of uh, blood sugar, that rises, the blood sugar requires a lot of insulin and you will tend to feel sluggish afterwards. Your blood sugar will be high. And if you have a problem with insulin, that is not so great for the body. Okay. Another aspect that comes up with blood sugar regulation is fructose. Everybody has heard of high fructose corn syrup, I'm guessing. And it's usually not nice things that we think about high fructose corn syrup. And there's a lot of justification for not thinking much nice things about high fructose corn syrup. So fructose is very closely related to glucose. And when you, when you actually metabolize glucose, it goes via fructose that you utilize glucose. But fructose is not regulated by insulin. Okay, so glucose is strictly regulated as to how much is in the blood, how much goes in the cells. Insulin um, does not regulate fructose. Fructose does not 
um, stimulate insulin secretion. So it does not contribute to a reduction of the blood sugar after eating. Um, when you consume fructose after exercising, you don't get muscle buildup. When you consume glucose after exercising, you do trigger that insulin response. Insulin triggers not just the uptake of glucose, but also growth in the muscle. With fructose, you don't have that. So you get the calories, but you don't get the insulin spike. You don't get the beneficial effect of having glucose after exercise. So glucose, again, is in all your uh, complex carbs, your breads, your pasta, your oats, your legumes. All of those are just glucose. Fructose is in sugar, table sugar. There is some in fruit. We're not worried about fructose in fruit. We are worried about fructose in sugar, and that includes the sugar in sweetened beverages. I'm not talking about actual sports drinks, not those that sound like sports drinks, but those that actually are sports drinks. So look at the label. Um, sodas, anything you get at your favorite coffee place. The fancy coffees are high in sugar um, and that includes half of the sugar is fructose. Okay, that fructose doesn't really help anything except building fat. Okay, additionally, so fructose gives you less muscle buildup than eating glucose after exercising, but it also triggers less leptin secretion from fat cells. Leptin tells your body, I am full, don't eat anymore. With sugar consumption, the glucose tells the body, okay, enough. Fat tells the body, okay, enough. Fructose does not. So fructose from table sugar, wherever it is, including your sugar sweetened beverages, leads to higher food intake and thereby weight gain. Okay. So most fructose will be metabolized and stored in the liver. The liver has a fat storage system. The liver also ships out the fat to other cells and that then leads to higher bad cholesterol levels, specifically triglycerides and BLDL. When you do a blood lipid profile, when your uh, doctor measures your lipid profile, the BLDL should not be there because you should be fasting. DLDL does go into LDL though. So if you have the high bad cholesterol, fructose may be uh, contributing to that. So fructose, because it is converted to fat, it also leads to fatty liver. Okay. Um, fructose consumption is linked to insulin resistance. So your blood sugar levels stay high because the cells don't want any more glucose in them. Okay, until you activate our favorite sensor AMPK by exercise, the cells say no more, I'm not gonna answer to insulin. And that leads to persistent high blood sugar levels, which then is called diabetes. Okay. Um, fructose also triggers the liver to produce more glucose because it does not stimulate insulin secretion. The liver uses protein to make glucose and that protein is exactly that protein that you were trying to build your muscle with. Okay, so your muscle protein is broken down to make uh, more glucose when your fructose intake is too high. Okay. Now, little disclaimer, the recommendations for sugar intake are largely based on uh, research on sugar sweetened beverages. So they really are at the moment seen as the worst contributor, but your fructose is in all table sugars. So your, uh, your cakes, your cookies, your snack bars, wherever um, you sweeten with table sugar does have the fructose.
All right, so I said sports drinks, as long as they really are sports drinks, are okay to consume when you exercise intensely. Okay, after half an hour of exercise, you don't need the sports drinks. But when you sweat a lot and you exercise a little more, then a sports drink can help you replenish your electrolytes, sodium and potassium, and it can help you replenish the carbohydrates that you're using up. That sensor AMPK gets activated as soon as you start exercising and you start using glucose from the, body, from the bloodstream, getting it into the muscle cells to exercise. When you exercise over a long time, it helps a lot to replenish that blood glucose level so that you can keep going. Okay, so um, a real sports drink has six to eight percent carbohydrate, so 60 to 80 grams per liter. Okay. When you read a label, typically it's eight ounces, some come in 12 ounces, and the math is up to you to figure out how many grams of carbs are in there. So 60 to 80 grams um, per liter then means that in 32 ounces, 60 to 80 grams in eight ounces, it should be 15 to 20 grams of um, glucose with a little bit of fructose to be a real sports drink. Okay. No more than 1% should be fructose. That's to accelerate or make it uh, faster to absorb the sugar into the uh, bloodstream for those who exercise really intensely, like your football players, or when you go on endurance sports, you go biking for three, four hours, then you want to really replenish. Right? There is also a recommendation for sodium that depends on how much you sweat. So if you look at the choices here, you have your typical gels that come with eight ounces of water on the side. They are in exactly the right range for your glucose and they are low in fructose. So you get the good stuff, you absorb it quickly, replenish and can just keep going on your exercise levels. Okay, and orange is similar. Orange has a lot of potassium, which is a good thing. It does not replenish the sodium. Okay, bananas, people swear by bananas, pretty good in the sugar levels, a little more uh, fructose uh, than the other choices. Um, also high in potassium and you need to get your, your sodium, your salt from other sources, right? Gatorade has a number of different uh, sports drinks. So I uh, use Gatorade and Powerade just to show where they fall. Gatorade Thirst Quencher, a little lower on the carb side. Um, it's good on the sodium side. Most people do not need to replenish sodium with the sports drinks because you get enough sodium uh, you know, from your foods. Uh, but it's low in potassium. Okay, same for the Powerade, that is a little lower in sodium, but it's pretty good on the side of glucose. Okay, so just examples of what really are sports drinks and what really are not sports drinks, like Sprite, for example, um, that has the sugar as uh, high fructose corn syrup, so you have a lot of fructose that doesn't get you the insulin spike, so you don't get the sugar into the cells where it needs to be. All right. So again, the sugar that comes from fruit, we are not worried about because fruits contain water, vitamins, fiber that regulate the absorption and metabolism of the sugar. So your glycemic index is lower, your insulin spike is lower, and you have less chance to get into that low um, glucose slump after uh, consuming fruits that you do get into when you eat things that have added sugars. And you see here uh, your, cho your chocolates and Yes, a number of breads have added sugars, even when the breads themselves are not perceived as sweets. 
I'm sure you've heard about the Subway breads that really have to be counted as cakes because they contain so much sugar. Croissants very often are made with sugar, but all the cakes that you actually buy as cakes or sweets also have sugar. They contain much more sugar and much more fat than any vegetable with no added nutritional value by the sugar. Okay. On the right, I've given you already some names for sugar, and it doesn't matter how many web pages tell you, oh, this is so much better. It still is a lot of fructose that you get with very little other nutritional value. So your cane sugar, agave syrup, honey, they are still concentrated sugar that should be limited to as little as possible. Okay. For the fun of it, uh, I've added a slide on even more names for added sugar that you will find in labels. Okay, so check your food labels of the things where you think, oh, there probably isn't any sugar in here. Check the label, read the ingredients and see, well, these are easy that they actually include sugar but there are a lot of terms that don't really sound like sugar and still are just added sugar. Good candidates to look at are sodas, um, energy drinks, and drinks that claim to be sports drinks. Again, check the label of your sports drinks, how much is glucose, how much is fructose. They should tell you, and it shouldn't be more than one 1.2% fructose in there. The rest should be glucose for the sports drink to be a sports drink. Um, fruit drinks do have sugar. Again, it's better to eat the fruit as a whole where you have the sugar packaged in its normal environment so that you keep the sugar regulated in the blood. Tea and coffee, watch how much sugar you put in there. Baked desserts, sweet snacks, those are notoriously high in sugar, candies, sugars. Check your breakfast cereals. Sandwiches may contain sugar. Luncheon meats are sweetened up. Um, and when you have dairy products that are something other than milk or plain yogurt, check how much sugar is in there. So quick translation, 15 grams of sugar is one tablespoon. Your standard cup of yogurt, when you buy one that is pre-mixed with stuff, somewhere between 24 and 36 grams of sugar. So you're eating this one thing that is fits into the palm of your hand of yogurt, which includes a tablespoon of sugar. So hence, my advice to get the plain yogurt and put in yourself what you want to put in there. If you want yogurt with fruit, put some fruit in there yourself. A okay, couple of foods that have sugar or added sugar where you may not suspect it. Ketchup is famous for containing a lot of sugar. Yes, tomato sauce also has sugar, but less than ketchup. So think when you use your condiments, think uh, exactly what you're gonna use. If there is a, a dish that you normally use ketchup for, think twice if it's not preferable to open a small thing of uh, tomato sauce and reduce the amount of sugar that you ingest with that. Bread uh, often contains added sugar. Everything that you have low fat or fat free Check if they just replace the fat with sugar. Pizza has sugar. Peanut butter, a lot of sugar. Uh, yogurt, I just said, canned fruit. Use the fruit in light syrup or in water. Dried fruit is very high in sugar. Dried fruit is very concentrated energy. It is still preferable to eating the sugar pure because the sugar is packaged in the matrix of the dried fruit. Sometimes the dried fruit is literally sugar coated. 
check the label how much they put in there. And cereal, particularly granola, is made with added sugars. You don't need added sugars. All right, other nutrients to be aware of to keep your blood glucose levels and your exercise levels um, well in check. Thiamine, vitamin B1. When you are thiamine deficient, you're not as insulin responsive as you usually are. You get thiamine deficient very easily if you get your energy from sugar because sugar does not come with thiamine. Okay. So many people who eat a lot of sugar that even if they don't gain weight, they don't get, get enough thiamine, become thiamine deficient, and then can no longer deal with the sugar they are eating, so their blood sugar levels increase. Minerals. People who have high blood sugar levels excrete more minerals, and the levels of minerals that are actually available to their cells are lower. So their cells become less functional. Getting the blood sugar levels under control, for example, with exercise, triggering the sensor AMPK to take up more um, glucose out of the blood helps with the levels of minerals. So it keeps all the body uh, cells more functional. Copper is another favorite. Copper is uh, contained in seafood. Yes, organ meats and liver, but that's not so much consumed anymore. Legumes, whole grain, nuts, and my favorite, dark chocolate is high in copper. So you can get your uh, copper from one or two ounces of chocolate uh, a day if that fits into the, um, the energy total. Chocolate, of course, does also come with fat and it needs to be very dark chocolate to get away from the sugar. Right, so copper deficiency leads to glucose intolerance and copper cannot be tested in a blood test. So you don't know if you are copper deficient, you can only measure it via intake. So if you are making smart food choices, legumes, whole grains, nuts, you have a lower insulin curve, lower um, blood glucose levels. So you're keeping your blood glucose levels better in check. And at the same time, you get enough copper to help with that blood glucose control. Zinc needed for insulin action, shellfish, poultry, meat. And for those who reduce their intake of those legumes, whole grain and mushrooms are high in zinc. So they should be part of a healthy diet that is lower in meat, poultry and shellfish. Iron is only of concern when it's overloaded. So people who eat a lot of red meat need to watch their iron levels. It comes with a regular physical exam. The physicians always check on iron levels. They are worried about both sides, too much or too little iron. Okay. Um, but iron overload is bad for blood sugar levels. Okay. Magnesium, vitamin A, um, polyphenols. Polyphenols are substances that come with plant foods. Best known for blood sugar control is green tea. That helps with the sensor AMPK to request more glucose from the blood stream. Okay. Um, protein, also important to keep the blood sugar levels um, level, it improves weight loss with exercise um, and high protein diets do not pose a risk unless the kidney is already diseased. So marked in red, once again, with exercise, you get the, impre uh, the improved, stronger activation of that low energy sensor AMPK, so you absorb the blood, the sugar out of the blood more easily and get your blood sugar levels under control. Okay, now I'm a little on time. Okay. 
I have to put protein in here because we're talking about exercise and protein is always the favorite of people who exercise a lot. Uh, typical for protein intake is one to 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight. Women tend to be lower in protein intake. What you actually need is 0.8 grams per kilogram uh, body weight. So it's around 55 to 75 grams uh, for an adult. And that goes starting at 19 years of age that recommendation is the same. The higher protein levels, again, are helpful for blood sugar control. Okay, 20 to 30% of your energy intake. If you track your food intake for a couple of days, you get a pretty good idea of where your protein intake is and if you want to increase it. The protein high foods, legumes, nuts, and of course, your meat, fish, poultry section. Dairy is also a very good source of protein and eggs. Okay, so on the vegetarian side, again, legumes are a very good source and nuts are also a good source of valuable fats if you are on the vegetarian side of things. Okay, fat does not really have much impact on diabetes or blood sugar levels. The general recommendation to um, stay healthy is high monounsaturated fatty acids. That's your olive oil, your canola oil, and high omega-3 from foods. So that's your seafood. But again, on the vegetarian side, you have your nuts and legumes as indirect sources of omega-3 fatty acids that help you stay healthy uh, in, on the cardiovascular side of things. All right, that was it for the impact of food choices. Any questions directly to that? All right, so just a quick reminder again, where does exercise come in? When you use your, your muscles, you, you use the energy that is in the cell. You use the glucose that the muscle cell actually has stored. The cell notices low energy levels. You have AMPK as a sensor that senses the low energy levels in the cells and then triggers the uptake of glucose into the cell out of the bloodstream. So you lower the blood glucose levels in the blood by exercise, okay? With this sensor, the insulin effect is increased. So you need less insulin to lower your blood glucose levels. And this effect of the low energy sensor stays active until your muscle cell has completely replenished its glucose storage. So you exercise for an hour, your glucose levels in the cell are very low. You have used up that glucose. It takes a while to replenish that. How long exactly it takes depends on what energy, uh, what exercise you did um, and how intense your exercise was, how well you are trained. So there are several factors that impact your recovery time. But throughout this recovery time, this sensor remains active and says, I need more glucose. I need to replenish what, what my muscle cell that I am in um, usually stores in glycogen, what I think it needs to store as glycogen for the next bout of exercise. So exercise works immediately to, you, to lower the blood glucose levels, but it also keeps working over typically 12 to 24 hours when you do a really long, you know, weekend warrior <laughs> endurance spell, it can take 48 to 72 hours during which this sensor remains active and says, please give me more glucose. I need more glucose in the cell, lowering the blood glucose levels to normal levels. Yeah. Somebody's coming.
Okay, so I said exercise intensity plays a role. The higher the intensity of exercise that you do, the more glucose you use for that exercise. Um, complex carb after a good uh, workout, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is building muscle substance, you want a high glucose load to trigger really an insulin spike. The downside is that the insulin spike will then make you sluggish afterwards. So if you want to just build um, a steady blood glucose level, you want a complex carb. Okay, if you're a bodybuilder, different story. But if you want to just stabilize your blood glucose and get fit, then a complex carb is really the best. Okay, so that's your whole grain bread. Dairy products are good. Vegetables are good. Fruits are good, particularly in combination. All those are good choices after exercise if the main goal is to get generally fit and stabilize the blood sugar levels. Okay, so again, the higher the exercise intensity, the more glucose you're utilizing. That becomes interesting when you choose what exercise you do. Um, at the same time as your glucose use in the muscle increases, your fat use decreases. Okay, so if your preferred exercise is cardio. You go for walks, runs, swims, biking, playing golf, what, what have you, whatever it takes, you know, a longer period of time during your exercise. Um, that is usually, you do that at a level where you can maybe just so not have a conversation anymore. So around here, medium use of glucose or at a lower level when you go for walks you're not using a whole lot of glucose, but your cell, your sensor still says, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. We've been walking for an hour. I need more glucose. Okay. So you're still using the glucose and because you're using fat, the energy levels in the cell still reduce and you still trigger that sensor to say, I need more energy. Okay. There are some risks with using exercise to lower blood sugar levels. And these risks exist for people who, who do not have a normal blood glucose uh, metabolism. Hypoglycemia, insufficient sugar in the blood. I won't say it does not happen to people without diabetes, but it's a lot harder to come by. People who do Endurance exercise for long bouts may experience uh, low blood sugar levels, but they are a lot easier to um, correct their low blood sugar levels than people with diabetes. People with diabetes need to be given then, um, particularly when they are on med medications, when they have low blood uh, sugar levels, they need to be given blood sugar. Okay. Um, it's not really the specific topic, but you do need to recognize when you exercise that you can take up too much glucose out of the blood and go into hypoglycemia. Again, for people who do not have diabetes, not a problem. People with diabetes have to be a little more careful and then measure their blood glucose and react with taking in some glucose deliberately if they are in hypoglycemia. Again, it's glucose they need. They do not need fructose. Fructose does not help with this. Okay. So for those who do have diabetes, best point in time to exercise is one to two hours after eating because the intestinal tract still digests the food and puts out more of the digested glucose into the blood. Okay. Um, 
It then reduces the risk of hypoglycemia because glucose is continuously absorbed. It reduces the need for insulin because you have that continued uptake of glucose into the muscle cells. When you're not well trained, don't start with a two hour workout. Start slowly, increase your exercise levels uh, slowly. And again, the benefit of exercise lasts 24 to 72 hours until the muscle cells really have replenished their glucose levels, okay? That means if it lasts 24 to 72 hours that you have to exercise every day, maybe you can leave out one day, but definitely not two days in a row. So that is your general recommendation to exercise six days a week. If you do five days a week, make sure you don't leave out two consecutive days. Okay. So if a person is hypoglycemic or if you think you are hypoglycemic, the best way to counteract that is glucose tablets. They are very handy because they are easy to transport. They are lightweight, so you can just have them somewhere, gel tubes are also very useful because the, the sports gels are high in glucose and that is what you really want. Raisins work, juice works. When you do take juice or soda, you do get the fructose with it that you don't really need, but you know it's better to get the fructose than to remain hypoglycemic. Sugar you can use in a pinch. Um, milk and dairy are not recommended that highly. If you have nothing else, that's okay because it does contain sugar. The protein in the milk slows the uptake of the sugar that in hypoglycemia you desperately need. Yes, you can use hard candies, jelly beans, gumdrops, but again, that comes with a, with a fructose that you don't necessarily want. So these means are when a person is in hypoglycemia and persons with diabetes who exercise should carry uh, some means of rescue if they do become hypoglycemic during the exercise. Okay. okay. So with diabetes, you want to know the starting blood glucose levels. You want to measure them start out at a 15 to 30 grams of glucose for every 30 to 60 minutes, and then measure blood glucose serially to see your own use of glucose. And the more trained you become, the more you train up, that gl those glucose levels will change. All right, after exercise, monitor blood glucose every one to two hours if you have diabetes so that you don't become hypoglycemic afterwards. All right, so that is exercise and blood sugar, including for people with diabetes. Any questions on this one? All right. So next question is, how much is too much carbohydrate? Recommended intakes for carbohydrates. So you get a lot of noise on this diet or that diet, whatever the fashion is in terms of diet. The pretty steady recommendations over the past number of years for carbohydrate intake is 130 grams per day. That value is quite meaningful as a calculation of how much your liver can produce and how much you actually need. Remember your brain, your red blood cells need sugar, need glucose specifically, your kidneys need glucose specifically. So we have a pretty good idea of how much glucose is actually used in the body on a daily basis. And we have a pretty good idea of how much your liver can um, make. When the liver makes glucose, it uses protein. The protein from the muscles that you have just worked so hard to build up. So we don't really want the liver to make too much 
glucose. Some it will make, particularly overnight, um, but we want to limit that. So this value of 130 grams per day is based on keeping the muscles that you have where they are and just covering what uh, you absolutely need during the day. If you want to set the carbohydrates in relation to your total energy, 45 to 65% is the recommendation. For people with diabetes, 45% seems to be the sweet spot of where blood sugar regulation for persons with diabetes is optimal. Okay. If your blood sugar control is normal, 45 to 65%. If you have diabetes, try to get down to 45 uh, percent of total energy. And if you track your food again over a couple of days, your normal intake, you get a pretty good idea of where your level of intake is. All these tracking softwares are so convenient to use that you don't need to know how to calculate it. It tells you right there, this much of your energy was from carbohydrates. Okay, so current average is 50% in the, in the US. You want a maximum of 10% from added sugars. And again, your tracking softwares, um, chronometer is the one that is uh, using, it, it's, it's free software that is supported by grants from the NIH, but you have a bunch of tracking software, whichever it is you use, you use to track your intake that gives you how much added sugar you actually take in. Everybody agrees that complex carbohydrates should be the source of your, of your carbohydrates. They come with little fructose, they are mostly glucose. So that's again, your whole grains, your legumes, starchy vegetables like sweet potato, corn, um, regular potatoes are also starchy vegetables, uh, cassava, plantains, all those are mainly glucose, complex carbohydrates. They come with a healthy amount of fiber, 14 grams per thousand calories. Um, so 14 grams per thousand calories means if you exercise a lot, you need more calories. That means you also need more fiber. And with the whole grains, the legumes, the vegetables naturally come with the fiber. You don't need fiber supplements. Get the fiber that is in the foods naturally. Um, do have a couple of slides on that um, as well. So how to find out your carbohydrates? I put the nutrition facts label here just to review that when you do look at the nutrition facts label to figure out how much carb is in there, first thing, check the serving size. How much of that package are you supposed to eat as one serving? How many calories are in there if you're controlling calories? And then the ones I have marked in orange, you should limit. So there should be limited saturated fat, uh, all the recommending agencies agree that saturated fat um, is the least preferable trans fat. There should be none in there. And sodium, you can get away with very, very little. You really only need 800 milligrams a day. Trying to restrict sodium to 1500 milligrams is really hard. Recommendation is 2,400 milligrams per day. That's your one tablespoon of salt. Uh, when you do check labels, do check the sodium content. Uh, you'd be surprised how many foods count as high in sodium. So you get the high or low from this percentage. Less than 5% is low, more than 20% is high. Okay. You want to look at the fiber. You want to get as much fiber as possible. Most people do not get enough fiber. Of course, you want to know the protein and then whatever is under the big line here. Those are there because most people don't get enough of these nutrients. Okay. You want the total sugars, the added sugars to be as low as possible. 
Okay. So a little bit on, on fiber, just uh, because it is so helpful in keeping the blood sugar levels low. So I've put in here, and you have that in your printout uh, meal plan with uh, five days of a relatively high fiber diet. The general recommendation how to get enough fiber, two and a half cups vegetable, two cups of fruit, three cups of milk, six ounces whole grain per day gets you enough fiber uh, for a diet of somebody who does not exercise excessively. So for your normal 30 to 60 minutes of exercise per day, uh, these fall into the range of what you should be eating. Okay. Um, for those added sugars, again, read the labels, choose wisely, eat less and add less sugar, substitute spices for sweetness. Cinnamon and vanilla are wonderful spices to use for the dishes that you expect to be sweet to reduce the need of sugar. For dishes where you add sugar to just underline um, the flavor like your marinara sauce that really shouldn't come with added sugar um, use extra spices basil goes very well and naturally with tomato sauce but there are a ton of other spices that you can use to replace the sugar replace the salt in your dishes and what's your bev beverages? They are, as I showed you, the major source of added sugars. So all your sodas, your fancy coffee concoctions that, that you buy for a lot of money, they come with a lot of sugar. And then your coffee and tea, if you add any sugar, reduce over time how much sugar you put in there so that you can wean yourself off that added sugar. Okay. A little bit on fiber, why we need it. It keeps you full longer. It reduces absorption of cholesterol. So the first medication to lower blood cholesterol was actually a concentrated fiber and it's still used. Um, it slows down the absorption of glucose so that you have that slower absorption, the lower insulin uh, secretion so that you never get into uh, low sugar levels. So it keeps you full longer. It prevents you from getting that feeling an hour after you ate that you need to eat again. Okay, it slows down absorption of fat. It doesn't reduce absorption of fat. It just makes it slower, slows down um, absorption of protein. But again, it does not reduce the absorption. It just slows it down. So you have a more constant influx from the intestines. There's a small effect on minerals. Fiber also binds water, so you get a softer stool, and anybody who exercises in long bouts uh, will appreciate the benefits of fiber in, uh, in that way. Fiber also feeds your healthy gut bacteria. I can't underline enough just how many benefits that provides to have a healthy gut bacteria. Yes, you can jumpstart that with eating probiotics, but really once you have those bacteria there, they only stay in your intestines if you keep feeding them and they eat fiber. So you need to eat the fiber to keep the um, healthy microflora in the intestines. Health benefits for Yes, your blood sugar control, the side effects of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, any of the chronic diseases that you can come up with have been shown to interact with the uh, gut bacteria. So healthy microflora prevents those chronic diseases and makes them less severe when you have them. 
So fiber really is something to increase and emphasize in what you eat. Okay, so I put those um, diseases that have research behind them together in this slide. Diverticulosis is one thing where a high fiber diet has been recommended for a long time. Hard to support that with evidence. It just makes sense that it works. You see that there are cancers in here listed as well that are warded off by a high fiber diet. Okay, high fiber diet or fiber in general, we cannot say without also saying resistant starch. That has become a buzzword in, well, wherever you look at food recommendations. So these foods depicted here are high in resistant starch and you can increase the amount of resistant starch, for example, in potatoes by cooking them, letting them cool, and then using them. That is your classic home fries that you eat for uh, a thorough breakfast where at breakfast you first feed your gut bacteria. Toast includes resistant starch that is designed to first feed the gut bacteria. Um, legumes are wonderful for the intestinal bacteria because they not only include resistant starch, they also include a whole lot of fiber. Potatoes with the peel include a good amount of fiber. Sweet potatoes include a good amount of fiber. And not to forget the peel of fruits that is edible, good amount of fiber, and the, out, the outer layer of grain has the fiber. So anything that is whole grain will give you the fiber. Refined grain is just that, that middle piece here that does not have any fiber. When you increase fiber in your diet, increase your water intake because the fiber does bind the water. So you do need to um, increase water intake to prevent dehydration. Okay. All right, so I would like to go ahead for the last few minutes to think a little bit of how to get there how to get there, not just in terms of exercise, but also in terms of diet modification. I put in there three slides on how to modify your behavior, what to think about, what you can do to get toward the healthier diet alongside your increase in exercise. Okay, so I just put that in there. These are reading uh, slides. You have that in your slides. I want to leave some time for questions and discussion um, just to point you to these slides with the behavior modification. All right. So the last point I want to make is the resources for smart food choice ideas. You have a ton of web pages and not all web pages are created equal. So there are the government tended ones that have the .gov behind them. So myplate.gov, um, it started out as something with a lot of room for improvement, and now they have done a lot of improvement on that. Uh, there is a question on sucralose. I'll get there in a minute. Um, Harvard has their own food site that I gave you the link for in here. It's less politically correct. It is more linked to, uh, to research. So the .gov sites always take into account what is feasible for people on their budget, whereas Harvard does not take any budgets into account. They just say, research says, eat this. <laughs> um, so their site is also full of 
you know, meal plans, ideas of how to choose foods, recipe ideas, etc. So that is very helpful. Other universities also have good food sites. The .edu is a good indicator of a reliable source. If you use .com web pages, make sure they are created by somebody with this credential, either RD or RDN is a must have credential for credible nutrition advice. If you're looking for sports specific, look for the CSSD and the MS credential um, adds credibility. You'll see that increasingly with the RD or RDN credential. Those are people who have studied nutrition a bit more than those who have just the RD or RDN credential. There are a lot of really, really good RDs who don't have a master's degree. So the RD really is the first thing to look for in your web pages that are .coms. Okay, the reason for that is that the term nutritionist or dietitian are not protected and anybody and everybody can call themselves a dietitian or nutritionist. Um, so misinformation is very broad. This credential is protected. Okay, so I wanted to underline that so that you can find the web pages um, that speak to you, that go for your culture, for your food choices, vegetarian, vegan, uh, keto, whatever you prefer, but get the credible web pages. Okay, so for the sugar replacers. Sugar replacers are only useful if they do replace energy intake from sugars. There is a lot of evidence that they actually don't. If you don't get the sugar from what you sweeten with sucralose, you will crave the sugar and get it elsewhere. The sugar replacers are also not good for your gut bacteria they wreak havoc in your uh, microflora. So if you eat a little, nothing bad happens. If you eat a lot of those, if you're you know, using diet beverages, diet sodas, that's too much of those uh, for the gut bacteria to handle. So your healthy gut flora actually turns into a less healthy uh, microflora, and that comes with a higher risk than of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, Alzheimer's disease. Those are the three that I recently looked at for their link to the gut bacteria. Uh, so with those sugar replacers, they count as high processed foods, so less is better. All right, that was all I wanted to tell you. Any questions that we haven't answered that you would like to discuss on the side? All right, wonderful. Well, then I thank you for hanging around and listening, being here asking smart questions. I hope you got something out of uh, the seminar. I'm sure you will provide feedback uh, to Teresa uh, about the seminar. I'm curious to get the feedback as well. And enjoy the rest of your evening.